Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, lecture series, anniversary lecture series from Osaka University. It is um, exactly six o'clock here in Japan. So I'm going to um, ask my fellow panelists if they could, could turn their, their cameras on, please. Thank you very much. So we, um, we are recording this session and uh, the video will be uploaded to the uh, learning management system that's being used to support this anniversary lecture series. So I hope that's okay uh, with everybody. Um, my name is Brendan Barrett and I'm a specially appointed professor at the Center for the Study of Co-Design at Osaka University. And uh, today we're going to be talking about how it may be possible to accelerate decarbonization of the uh, of the economy and um, we're going to look a little bit also at the situation in the us and japan so you have some some basis for on comparison uh, we have two guest speakers um, here today and so i would actually like to give them an opportunity to to introduce themselves to you um, perhaps we could begin with uh, professor mckenna kaufman Hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. Thank you so much for the invitation, Brendan. I'm Professor McKenna Kaufman. I'm the director of the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I'm also a professor of urban planning there. Um, so most of my research is on climate change mitigation with a strong emphasis on Hawaii, which I'll talk about today, but also in, as a sort of a US state in terms of state level climate action. So uh, we have, um, McKenna and I have been collaborating, I think since about 2008 to implement a course on climate change and science and solutions in the Asia Pacific region. But also McKenna, you're quite um, intimately involved in the um, policy formulation on, on Hawaii. And um, I think you're a member of the climate commission there, is that correct? Yes, uh, we have a five member uh, climate change commission, three of us from the university uh, for the island of Oahu. So it's for the city and county of Honolulu. And yeah, I've been very involved in that, which has actually pulled me much more into adaptation in terms of city jurisdictional issues. Fantastic. It'll be really interesting to hear any insights you have about this, the challenges of actually making policy. Um, rather than just the academic work and the theory that um, I, I will be sharing. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, it's lovely to have you participating. And next we have uh, Professor Michinori Uasu, who's actually just down the corridor in this building here. Um, but I think it's the first time we've um, done something together since um, we've been working in this center. So um, Professor Uasu, maybe if you could talk a little bit about your, your background. Okay, thank you, uh, Brenda. Uh, my name is Michinori Uwasu uh, from the Center for the Study of Co-Design. Uh, Brenda is my colleague, but uh, this is actually the first opportunity to work together. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm an economics trained uh, researcher working in the field of sustainable development. Actually, my research field is uh, vast ranging from the uh, policy and the technology assessment to uh, uh, kind of qual qualitative approach uh, by doing some a uh, workshop to uh, facilitate people to uh, envision the society, etc. And uh, actually, uh, I joined Osaka University in 2006. Since then, I have been working with uh, researchers from different backgrounds like engineering in the humanities and the natural sciences. So uh, I'm doing uh, pretty much uh, interdisciplinary research and education. And I'm very excited to uh, share my uh, work and the thoughts on uh, zero carbon uh, strategies in Japan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed you've actually done quite a lot of work overseas as well. I saw you, um, you been in projects in Thailand, Vietnam, and China. So I'm sure you have a bigger picture, bigger perspective um, around how you know, societies are responding to this um, zero carbon challenge. And it would be great to get your insights on that. Uh, I forgot to say my background. I'm actually an urban planner 
by training, but I very quickly went into environmental sustainability um, after graduating. And I've moved between academia um, and the United Nations. I was, in, I was at the UN University for a number of years. And also from, um, env I was also in environmental consultancy in the UK for um, five or six years as well. So I kind of feel like I've seen the best of all worlds. And um, I also like being in academia as well. And I'm particularly passionate about the topic that we're going to um, discuss today, which is this, um, this idea of decarbonizing. And um, the format that we have in mind is that there'll be three uh, short presentations around 20 minutes each. I'm going to kick off by actually trying to explain uh, how I understand um, decarbonization and this whole notion of net zero carbon, which has become sort of the, the dominant uh, discourse around um, how we go forward in dealing with climate change. That will be followed by uh, McKenna's presentation on um, what Hawaii is going to do and how uh, Hawaii is progressing towards a, a, net, a carbon neutral economy. And then Uasa Sensei will finish by uh, talking about what's going on here in Japan. So hopefully it'll give you a, a very interesting and broad perspective. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the um, question and answer box so we can, and we can have a Q&A at the end. So we'll do the three presentations and then we'll set a discussion. And I'm going to begin. So I'm just going to start my, um, share my slides with you. Okay, I hope you can see that all fine. And you can see the topics there for the three presentations and the basic timing. So we'll be finishing um, at uh, 7.30 Japan time. Okay, so what is accelerated decarbonization? I'm sure that's kind of uppermost in your mind and very, very simply in my understanding and in the work of quite a few people recently, the emphasis has been on to go uh, carbon neutral or net zero by 2035. So that's very, very soon. And you might ask why and how could that be possible? Well, it's interesting because there's been a sort of plethora of, of publications and reports coming out recently pointing in, in the di that direction. Um, these reports have been at the national level um, such as this uh, Goldman School public policy report from the US, which is talking about a net zero by 2035, or we've seen at the local level, uh, for instance, Copenhagen, uh, trying to be a carbon neutral city by uh, 2025, or Newcastle in the United Kingdom going for 2030. So there seems to be some momentum building up around this notion of um, decarbonizing as quickly as possible. At the same time, we have this, what's called the Agenda 2030, which is the objective of trying to meet the sustainable development goals by that date. As you may recall, the, the goals were adopted in 2015 with a 15 year implementation period. So we have this convergence going on of rapid, um, implementation of climate action that has to run in tandem with the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And it'd be interesting to see whether that can actually have a multiplier effect or whether there may be even some conflicts and misalignments that result in trying to achieve these different objectives. I'm, I'm sure all of you here are familiar with the, the Paris Agreement, which was basically decided in 20. Uh, December 2015 and I think at that time we all thought uh, the world was saved but unfortunately uh, progress has been somewhat limited uh, partly because of the uh, Trump administrations um, wanting to pull out of the Paris Agreement and we've had a very sort of rocky uh, four-year period wondering what would happen around cl uh, global climate policy. It's interesting, though, to see even the uh, Secretary General, uh, Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Espinosa, arguing about the synergies or mentioning the synergies between the, the 2030 agenda 
and the Paris Agreement. And basically she's sort of saying that these two um, factors could really promote a more sort of positive systematic um, transformation that would re lead us towards a resilient, productive, healthy environment for the present and future generations. And I find it quite intriguing that the, some of the language that's now being used by international policymakers and um, scientists is actually quite close to the language we heard from activists over an, a number of years, where they're talking about system change, not climate change. So the question is, how is it possible then to bring about dramatic systemic change? The other thing that we need to recognize is that our inability or our slowness to actually implement action and mitigating climate change could undermine uh, the attainment of the sustainable development goals. For instance, we could have um, extreme weather events, um, wildfires, as you've seen in Australia, flooding going on in different parts of the world, uh, drought, and so on. Those kinds of climate-related events could actually undermine our ability to achieve the goals and require that resources are redirected to actually um, um, helping the victims of these um, extreme weather events. So it's really in our interest to move very quickly on resolving uh, climate change. So where are we? Uh, basically, the global consensus, and this came out not from the Paris Agreement, but from a report in 2015 on global warming of 1.5 degree was that in order to remain below 1.5 degree, we need to go net zero by 2050. So net zero by 2050 became our um, target from 2018 onwards. And it's only subsequent to that, that that governments have begun to say, we will aim for a net zero by 2050 target. I think the UK government was one of the first to actually commit to it. What I'm actually arguing uh, in favor of is net zero by 2035. And I'm not alone in that. Um, and one of the reasons is because the further I feel, the further away we make this target, the more likely it is that our leaders will push the ball, kick the can down the road, so, so to speak. They'll, they'll, they'll leave action for the next prime minister or the next president. So uh, we really need to make sure that uh, the dra dramatic transformation is happening here and now. And we're starting to see, I think as a result, many um, organizations developing pathways that will take us there. And this one, for instance, is just published very recently from the International Energy Agency. And they're starting to become quite um, ambitious uh, in, their, in their objectives. So for instance, this one suggests that by 2021, there should be no new oil gas fields approved for development and no new uh, coal mines or mine extensions. And so if by 2035, there should be no internal combustion uh, engine car sales. So I, I feel that um, I, you know, the International Energy Agency hasn't always been as, as ambitious as this. So it's very, uh, I think it's quite um, positive to see this, this happening, but it would be also wonderful to see the sustainable development goals uh, really supporting this. So for instance, around you know, the greening of industry, the introduction of clean energy, how we change uh, production and consumption patterns and so on, so that the two work together. Now, what's, um, what's interesting is this, the pace at which we need to see uh, emission reductions happening. And here we have a, a report from Bloomberg that says that you know, if we want to stay below this 1.5 um, degree increase in temperature, we really need to see emissions declining by between around six to 10% per annum. So really what you need to be checking every year is whether or not we're, we're matching that level of ambition. And um, according to Bloomberg, but according to many other commentators, the next 10 years are critical. So I think we could almost argue that the next decade is make and break as to whether or not we get on the right trajectory because the reality looks like this. So essentially, as you can see, um, in terms of the atmospheric concentration of CO2, it's been uh, rising year on year, just gradually going up and up and up. So it's an upward trend. And then when it comes to 
global CO2 emissions. Um, although there have been some dips that have happened tied into global events like the oil shocks or the collapse of the Soviet Union or the, you know, the global financial uh, crisis that we have, um, the trajectory seems to just be upwards. And um, even with this current situation of COVID, although we've seen a, you know, a significant percentage drop in, in, in emissions, mainly due to lockdowns across large parts of the world. The danger is that we'll just bounce back and then we'll be back, we'll be back on the, um, the trajectory. So this is really an opportunity to break that trend, but how or whether that will happen is really not clear right now. The other worrying aspect is that it looks like we're rapidly moving towards crossing that 1.5 degree temperature threshold. And this is a report from the Carbon Brief which is basically saying, you know, although estimates and scenarios vary, we could actually go over the 1.5 degree threshold um, around, they're saying around 2030 to 2032. It could be a bit later, but it also could be earlier than that. So that's um, really worrying because it means within a decade or so, we might have crossed a very significant uh, threshold, um, a point of, that is very difficult to return from. So there's a need to be a sense of urgency, a greater sense of urgency. And um, this report from Saul Griffith on rewiring America, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, kind of captures in a nutshell the situation that we face. And that is the longer we wait, the harder it gets to actually mitigate. And so you, you know, if we do leave it very late, then in order to ensure um, uh, that temperature increases are not out of control, we need a steeper emissions, emission reduction curve. The good news, there is good, very, very good news. And that is, you know, following the US uh, election, uh, Biden has brought the US back into the Paris Agreement. And most recently, he has announced a 50% um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And that's huge. Now, if the, U if the US really does push forward in this direction, and if other company, uh, countries follow this example, then the, the change is going to be truly transformative. But there are lots of challenges that we, because as we, re as we go into implementation, we realize how difficult it actually is. So there's a few points I like to highlight here. The first is that carbon capture and sequestration has been a large part about how we achieve emission reductions, but it has, it's difficult to get it up to the scale that we need. There are all, also lots of technical and regulatory issues associated with this transformation, such as how do you fast track these projects or do you need to upgrade the grid? Um, the scale of financial investments is huge. I'll talk about that very soon. And then there's a question of um, availability of the human resources and skills that we need. And perhaps the biggest is how do we check, get the vested interests, so for instance, those behind fossil fuel or the public in general behind it. Now, just on the question of carbon capture and sequestration, there are, about, there are only 65 commercial plants in operation right now, and they have the capacity to extract 40 million tons per annum uh, from the atmosphere. However, by 2050, if we're going to meet the Paris Agreement target, we need to be able to extract 5.6 billion tons per annum. So you can see there's a huge task there. And so, um, yeah, be careful when people suggest that carbon capture and sequestration is going to be an easy answer to this problem. It's not, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of resources to achieve. The other interesting aspect uh, is that now we're, we're really thinking about this transformation and uh, reaching it dramatically. This is a report from Princeton University on um, um, net zero America by 2050. You start to see the land use impacts associated with it. So for instance, the light blue shows where uh, wind generation will be required and notice um, along the Atlantic coast, there's a lot of wind farms predicted. The, the, the brown color shows the PV development there. And then there are going to be major um, investments required in tra the, the transmission network. 
and transmission capacity. So the, the Princeton report is really clear that there will be significant uh, visual, ecological and land use impacts and that this will be impacts on you know, the ecological resources, the marine environment, and it's likely that there will be community opposition. So the question is, how do you, um, how do you deal with that? How do we get the communities behind it? Another community that's going to struggle to accept this rapid transformation is the coal mining community. So the Princeton report is actually indicating that for all net zero pathways that it's analyzed that seven, the 700 existing coal mines and the 500 plus coal plants in the US need to close down by 2030. So then there's a question of uh, how are they impacted when you think in terms of the sustainability goals, if they don't have access to, an, to employment. Yes, there may be some positive health impacts from declining uh, air pollution, but that community in particular is going to struggle with this rapid transformation. Another area that is becoming, it's gaining increasing attention um, is the um, vit uh, critical minerals that we need to support this uh, deployment of clean energy technologies. And again, the International Energy Agency has just published a report that looks into this. And what you can see, for instance, is that the electric car um, requires more of these um, critical minerals around lithium and graphite and so on than the conventional car. And it's a similar problem with um, renewable energy resources compared to say coal, natural gas and nuclear. And there's a debate about how we're going to be able to firstly mine all of these resources and second, whether we need to really look into how we can recycle them and create a cir circular economy around them. Otherwise we may have shortages and that may undermine the speed of the transition. So let's go back to this um, 2020 report by Saul Griffiths on rewiring America. And um, it's really interesting. So he's one of the proponents of this 2030 target. And what he did is he analyzed all of the energy flows across the US, uh, extracting data from all of the governmental reports. And he found that it's possible for the US economy to run on 40% of its current um, energy consumption level. And the way you, that you would do that is by trying to remove what's called uh, waste energy, energy that's associated with the sort of inefficient distribution systems we have. So perhaps a more decentralized energy, uh, renewable energy system is going to be much more efficient. So this was a really interesting point. And um, he also made some other uh, recommendations the first was that we need to do this, we need to mobilize as if we're in a wartime situation and many other commentators, for instance, John Kerry um, at the US has actually argued this as well, but that we will create uh, 25 million new jobs, but it involves electrifying everything and it needs to be um, basically four times as much electricity. So all of that should be renewable. How much is it gonna cost? So firstly, um, this, these are, I would say, guesstimates, but it's in the order, according to Saul Griffith and his colleagues, of about 20 to $25 trillion over 20 years. And so how, how much is that? It's a, it seems like a huge figure. Well, just think about the US GDP in, in 2019 was equivalent to 21 trillion. So it's about one year of the US um, GDP expended for this purpose. But remember, a lot of it is redirected funding, moving funding away from, say, um, uh, highways and airports towards um, renewable energy resources. OK, so the Princeton report is really interesting because they, 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 give, they have a, another estimate uh, that a much more modest scale of investment of um, 2.5 trillion in the 2020s but they break it down into different areas. So you have electricity generation, you have the transmission lines, you have the buildings, you have industry and fuels, you have vehicles and so on and so forth. So um, again, I think we need much more detail on this and that's what will happen as we progress with implementation. But the Princeton report basically comes up with um, six pillars that will be a, uh, the basically the foundation of the 
the rapid um, decarbonization. And this echoes the point that Saul Griffiths and others have made about efficiency and electrification as being one of them. Then the shift to uh, clean energy renewables, and they include nuclear in there. Um, the promotion of zero carbon fuels, so bioenergy and hydrogen is in there. Carbon capture, I've already talked about that and the challenges. Another area is non-CO2 emissions, which is basically emissions tied into, say, agriculture and land use. And then there's the notion of whether we can enhance the, the, the sinks and forest management and so on and so forth to capture more um, CO2 emissions. So what do we need? Um, basically, we need the climate action and the SDGs to work, um, to work in tandem and not to undermine each other that we need all tiers of governance, government focused on these same goals. And that's why I think McKenna's presentation is really interesting to see what's happening in Hawaii. We need uh, an increased level of ambition. So that's why it will be good to look at what's happening in Japan. It's just recently committed to a, a much more ambitious target. And we need to redirect financial resources to move them away from fossil fuels and high carbon infrastructure into this uh, low carbon uh, economy. And perhaps the biggest challenge is left to the end is how to do that in a just and inclusive way. But I like to finish with this, which is a, a nice quote from Saul Griffith. And um, I really recommend you look at his work, but basically he's saying that our, our inability to respond to climate change so far is just a failure of imagination and that we haven't been able to convince ourselves that it's going to be great and his basic point is, it's going to be great. So there, thank you very much for your attention. And with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing. And McKenna, it's over to you next. Great, thanks, Brendan. Um, that was really good in terms of, I think, giving the broad overview. And uh, actually, you covered a lot of the things that I was thinking about covering, but didn't have the time. So this is perfect. It kind of complements very well. So I'm going to take a really deep dive into the situation in Hawaii. Um, just to, you know, as Brendan said in the introductions, um, I'm because I'm very involved in sort of the policy aspects in Hawaii, sort of the on the ground, how do we actually do this? Um, from an implementation standpoint and kind of think about Hawaii in the context of, of the US, right? Uh, it is a, a, the 50th state. We're constrained by, constrained by US policies for better and worse, um, and as well as have lots of ambition. So the title of my talk is Pathways to a Carbon Neutral Hawaii. We actually have a legal goal of becoming carbon net negative, um, which that is a slight but important difference. At the same time as I'll sort of just give the punchline up front that we're so far from actually achieving it, those you know splitting hairs at that level of semantics really at this point um, doesn't make much difference. But to me, this idea of just really deep decarbonization within a decade is really should be the emphasis and is the emphasis. Okay. First, just a little bit of context again to link to the sustainable development goals. Um, the, you know, obviously it's, it's affordable and clean energy, sustainable communities and cities, as well as climate action is really the emphasis of what we're talking about here, but also this issues of life on land and life in the water. I think do come into play, particularly as we start thinking about massive electrification. Um, and as Brendan talked about, just that interaction to, to habitats, right? And what is that gonna do in terms of moving into new spaces and places uh, for energy exploration, even if renewable, right? Um, one of the, the wheel at the bottom, which you've probably not seen before, is our localized version of the SDGs for Hawaii. So uh, we have something called the Aloha Plus Challenge, and we're actually recognized by the United Nations as one of the local 2030 hubs. So we had been doing our sort of Hawaii version of SDGs 
before 2015, before the SDGs were actually put into place. Oddly, we were actually using a very similar color scheme. That was a coincidence. That was very nice. And so it was kind of easy to tweak again into the United Nations color scheme. That was kind of weird. Um, but this is a, a public private partnership. Uh, it's really organized through a nonprofit locally, locally, but has tremendous buy in from governmental entities, um, from sort of, you know, elected officials, from the counties, uh, the university is a signatory. And the idea is that if we can sort of collectively commit to these things, as well as track it, that hopefully we'll do a better job at actually attaining these goals. So there, it's not just about climate, it's, it's broader sustainability goals, much more akin to the SDGs, but, but the, the carbon targets are in there as well. So if you're interested in checking that out, it's the Aloha Plus Challenge. So as I said, we have this goal to become carbon net negative as soon as practicable and no later than the year 2045. And this was, this is such an important goal, right? And so for me, this is, I was so excited when this became legislation in Hawaii. And to me, this is the kind of, the kind of target we need, um, science-based target that we need across the board. And in the United States, really this was the political momentum in response to Trump pulling out of the, or stating he was pulling out of the Paris Agreement, right? So um, we passed this uh, legislation through our, uh, through the 20, it was kind of coming off of 2017 within that legislative session, and then it became law in 2018, right? And there was really this movement amongst US states to say, okay, even if at the federal level, we have no intention of seeing the Paris Agreement through, we are still in, right? And so Hawaii passed this carbon net negative target, which really does set this overall tone for, um, for how to move forward. That said, it was much more of a political statement, right, of we are still in, than a well thought out, this is how we're gonna do it, and this is the pathways we have, and this is what we're gonna, you know, how we're gonna implement it. So now we're in that phase, right? Sort of once the, once the goal was put out there, it's okay, now how do we actually, how do we actually do this? Um, and in the US context, it was, it's the US Climate Alliance is the alliance of states that have committed to similar targets. Um, not all of them have actually legislated. Actually, I, I think we might be the only one that's actually legislated a target. I wouldn't say ours is binding, right? There is no binding mechanism and it's not ever gone to rulemaking. So that said, but because, what, because it did pass through a bill, there is some legal sort of heft to it, uh, which the other states haven't done. So mainly in the US context, the legal heft comes from um, say legal action after the fact. If the target is not met, the state could be held accountable and liable, right? Which of course is a good thing to keep reminding them now, right? So, um, but other states haven't committed to quite the same kind of target uh, within legislation, but have definitely kind of made similar kinds of commitments and notably, a new number of them have really moved forward on decarbonization, right? California being kind of the leading state in terms of actually implementing decarbonization policies like its cap and trade program. So just stepping back a little bit, what does Hawaii's emissions actually look like? Um, and I should have said from the, in the beginning, in this presentation, I'm gonna pull from three different projects that I've been working on mainly in this sort of year during COVID. Um, and this is the first. So um, my, myself and my research team, we have been working with the state um, and ICF International, which is a, a air quality consulting firm um, that also does the US inventory. We've been working to develop Hawaii's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. And what my research team is focused on is really thinking about the projections into the future um, so this is just a snapshot, right? And so what are those things that are gonna affect our greenhouse gas emissions? Um, <clears throat> and here you can see our actual emissions trend from our, these are our, our official state inventories. And then what is our best guess of what's happening? And as Brendan said, right? 2020 is the, the largest decline in emissions on a per annum basis ever in the globe. 
but it's actually not nearly as large as I think people thought it was going to be. Um, and the trend is that it's going to go right back up to normal. So here, we basically um, are estimating that it's going right back up to pretty much where it was going to be in terms of what our estimated trend downward was if we actually see our policies through, which is a really big if, right? So historically, what we have here is our 1990 emissions, which sort of serve as our Kyoto target basis, right? We, we estimated our 1990 emissions in order to have that baseline. Um, in 2008, Hawaii passed uh, its first greenhouse gas policies that required Hawaii get back to 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2020. Um, I had sat on that state government task force um, and we deliberated for, I think a two year period on what to do about it. Frankly, nobody agreed, nobody could come to any kind of majority agreement. We ended up having a majority and minority uh, dissent report about this where basically we were split along the lines of should there be a carbon tax. And in the end, there was no carbon tax. The state legislature didn't pick it up. However, they did pass a renewable portfolio standard. And the motivation for that really came from the um, world oil price spikes as well as the, the great recession in 2009, right? This was a time period where oil prices went through the roof. Hawaii is um, not unique as an island, but unique in the US in that we are predominantly burn oil for our electricity generation. It's, it's common of other island areas, but makes us very distinct within the US context. So here the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative was born. And that's really what motivated the first, the, the state's first renewable portfolio standard, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but here you can see we haven't done much in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. The only thing I can say that's good news there is what is that greenhouse gas emissions have not gone up in a period of economic expansion, right? This is a period of economic recovery where we would have expected greenhouse gas emissions to have an upward trend. Um, but really I would credit the, the, the switching of our electricity sector to renewable sources at just sort of you know, stopping that at neutral. And you can see that in, um, in, the, in the trends a little bit, stationary combustion is electricity. And you can see that that is getting relatively smaller just a little bit, it's not that much, right? So we're really far from deep decarbonization. Um, just to, to back up a little bit about renewable portfolio standards, these are very common um, policy mechanisms, particularly in the US context, but also internationally. Uh, I believe Japan had a renewable portfolio standard and then it was, re it was replaced by the feed-in tariff. Um, I don't know how long it was in uh, operational there. But there are 30 states, inclu including the District of Columbia, that have a renewable portfolio standard currently. It's probably the most powerful implementation tool that states have available to them. It's entirely in their jurisdiction to operate and to implement without federal uh, oversight um, to make good on renewable energy. And as Brennan said, if we are going to electrify everything in order to have this transition, this is absolutely critical. The problem is it's happening in a really piecemeal meal way in the US. So, and, and in the continental US, it's basically, you know, everything is a connected electricity grid um, where you have power sharing over major regions. So just having one state move ahead doesn't take you as far as you wanna go, right? You really do need all states to move ahead, which does sort of beg for, for federal intervention. That said, Hawaii being an island means that we can really sort of, you know, make a huge difference in our greenhouse gas emissions from the electric sector by switching to renewable sources of energy. And our goal is actually to have 100% of our sales of electricity through renewable sources by the year of 2045. It's a little bit of tricky language. 100% doesn't mean 100%. It's a little hard to explain the, math, the double counting math, but in my best estimate, what our goal really is, is to have about 70% of our electricity generated from renewable sources by the year 2045. Um, interestingly, 
after Hawaii passed uh, its 100% law, other states similarly passed 100% laws. So there is this sort of um, competition amongst states, particularly you, you, the ones that are hatched here are the ones that um, after Hawaii passed their 100% law, so did they, and then Wisconsin and New York did as well. Uh, so there is this kind of competition to have the best RPS in the country, which I'm gonna say, if you're gonna compete about anything, like this is a very good thing to be competitive about, right? And actually see through. Um, Hawaii's RPS to date has been quite successful in terms of the layout of renewable energy. Uh, we met our, our RPS goal of 2020 to get to 30% of our generation from renewable sources. Um, the, the first sort of date this went into effect was in 2010 and the first compliance date was 2015. Um, and the second compliance date was, was last year. You can just see how much renewable energy has come on the grid in a relatively short period of time, right? In a 10 year period. Um, definitely not the deep decarbonization we need to be achieving, but it certainly changed the trajectory of this curve, right? Most of it has been through rooftop solar. Um, the, to some extent, that's a very saturated market in Hawaii. Um, about, my estimate is that about 70% of single family owner occupied homes have solar on their roofs already. Uh, and we, so we would need dramatic changes in the way that we price our electricity and in the way we incent people to put solar on their roofs in order to start breaking into other markets rental renter occupied markets, um, as well as <clears throat> um, multi unit dwelling markets. So without, without really totally restructuring our electricity rates, I think this is basically a, it's a sector that's going to grow very, very slowly moving forward. Um, with, I expect to see the largest growth in utility scale solar, which is this yellow, uh, bright yellow. But that said, the pushback there is really about do we about communities not wanting to commit land into that purpose, you know, for a number of really good reasons, right? Because of the ecological impacts, the impacts to habitats, sort of, you know, the unknown impacts in terms of the opportunity cost of committing it into that, you know, committing the land for that purpose um, for such a long period of time. Also the loss of agricultural land. So we are allowing renewable energy to be put on agricultural lands here as one of the kind of prime places for it, um, as, and also as a way of protecting conservation space. But that does make a very clear sort of food versus energy trade-off. Um, we all similarly, there's been a lot of contestation about the wind projects here, and particularly wind interacting with in, uh, endangered species. Uh, the Hawaiian hoary bat is endemic to Hawaii, and there's been a tremendous amount of takes of of the hoary bat. Um, and so whether wind will actually grow as a, as a resource, I think is a huge question mark, which doesn't leave a lot left in terms of how do we actually move forward, right? The geothermal power plant, um, you'll notice that it went down uh, in, the, in 2017. It basically had to be powered down because there was the the volcano erupted. There was a Kilauea eruption a couple of years back that went straight through the power plant. It's actually it's about half operational now, I think, and they do plan it to get plan to get it back to full full operation later this year. Um, but it's also very constrained by just the population size of Hawaii Island, and there's been a tremendous amount of um, cultural pushback on geothermal use in Hawaii from a native Hawaiian land use perspective. So just you know, really quickly to go into the concerns around wind, this is a, a quick map of the existing wind projects in the state. Um, and this is the latest one that was built on Oahu. Uh, that's a picture I took when driving by it. And that's a local um, middle school and high school. And it's right over it. It's incredibly close to the community incredibly close to it's and there's actually an elementary school in between where I took this photo and the wind turbines so it's it's incredibly close to the school district um, and this was very much contested so protesters had blocked the road and cut the power lines 
into the development project. It ended up having to be cleared by force by the National Guard um, and the project was built uh, basically in a very sort of militarized fashion in order to clear the protesters. So this is how contentious projects have gotten in Hawaii. Um, I mean, I'm somebody who thinks we absolutely need to decarbonize and decarbonize rapidly and we need to have renewable energy projects. Yet I look at this photo and go, ooh, we really shouldn't be putting them that close to, to communities, right? Like we also need to be doing this uh, in a better way, but it's these kinds of missteps that are gonna lead to a lot of backlash and then I'm gonna slow the process down. Um, and this has been a long standing kind of concern in Hawaii. These are photos I took about 10 years ago when the plan to decarbonize and to meet the RPS was to build a huge uh, wind project on the island of Lanai and bring that energy to the population center of Oahu. And these were just two signs I took pictures of in people's yards. You can sort of see very quickly the community there's feelings, right? One is a, a labor union sign, right? So when do, you know, this, this is good for new jobs, right? And the other, this no wind turbines, no regrets. I think to me that connotes, do we really wanna commit our lands to this? Let's, you know, this is a long-term commitment of lands. Let's not do that. Um, switching gears a little bit to kind of think about, okay, so we have a lot of opposition to renewable energy projects. We, it's also our strongest tool to actually decarbonize and meet some of our goals. What might we actually do moving forward? One thing um, my research team worked for probably the first six months of the pandemic, just, you know, sitting in front of our computers and on Zoom constantly was helping the city do all the technical research and the facilitation work for their first ever climate action plan. So this was released on Earth Day, which is uh, in April. Uh, and it's uh, Oahu's first ever climate action plan. And it's really was a process of helping the city think through what are those things that are in your abilities to change? How many greenhouse gases are actually associated with those actions? Um, and then what can you actually sort of commit to, right? Uh, we focused on, on nine different overarching strategies, um, heavy emphasis on land use because that's what's really in the city's sort of zoning abilities. And these are very long-term things, right? Changing zoning isn't going to decarbonize Oahu in the next five years, but over the long-term, probably one of the most important things we can do. Um, and then, also, I'll just zoom in on strategy seven, which is really about expanding the city's capacity for proactive renewable energy planning, because that is what we see as sort of the most impactful thing we could do from a greenhouse gas standpoint. So it was actually kind of the elephant in the room of all the greenhouse gas actions that we um, did sort of built models out for and estimated in order in reducing uh, renewable energy or redu reducing electricity's footprint by renewable energy was a, was attributed to about six, 76 million metric tons of, of carbon dioxide um, saved. And the next uh, action that the city could take was about eight, right? So this is the biggest, most important thing we could do as an island state in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But if we don't do this in a lot better way, if we keep having projects like the picture of the wind turbines over the school, then we're not going to achieve these goals. So really this was about sort of thinking through what could the city do to commit to being more proactive, to sort of building its capacity for land use planning, for community planning, in order to actually achieve these nice downward sloping curves, right? Which would lend itself to uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. I mean, that's the thing about these kind of technical reports that Brendan talked about, right? Technologically, this is so entirely feasible, right? We absolutely know how to build out renewable energy. We know how to integrate it with, with huge battery systems. It's doable. It's really, can we do it in the implementation side? On the transportation side, I think I have to speed up a bit here. So I'm gonna start talking faster. On the transportation side, um, the four county mayors had committed to 100% um, clean sources of ground transportation by 2045. 
really kind of mirroring the RPS target. Here, I would say there was, you know, it sounds really good, but how do you actually do that? Particularly when transportation, particularly light duty vehicles, so passenger cars and trucks are really federally regulated in the United States, right? So this is our, our best estimate for how federal regulations for the corporate average fuel economies will affect Hawaii's greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector over time. And so we think that from, you know, over the next 25 years, we will actually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by, you know, a notable amount by about 40% um, just from federal policy, from existing federal policy and the turnover of cars and trucks. But how do you speed that up, right? The, the best way to speed it up is electrification of transportation, which is, you know, this is our, our scenario of Hawaii has the ability to say all cars sold are going to be EVs from now on. And if you did that, how long would it take for them to actually be all EVs on the road, right? Um, but the truth is we don't actually have that ability. So US states can't, can't do that. California kind of tries and we sort of follow California and cheerlead for them, right? Um, but it also means that there's a national harmonized average for greenhouse gas emissions in the country. So for every, it's, it's, it's very disheartening actually. So for every extra EV you sell in one jurisdiction, it means an extra gas guzzler gets sold in another jurisdiction, right? And they eventually, and, there, and that's, there's no reason at the moment to think that that's not binding. So until that policy is changed, um, it's a bit of an uphill battle. So what this means is the city could commit to, we, we devised you know, about 45 actions. They're all really ambitious. Uh, well, not all, They're, a lot of them are really ambitious. Many of them are very hard to do. And we estimated that if they put all of that in place, they could get to this yellow line, which was really depressing, actually. Um, it's like, well, we have to get here right? Um, how do we actually get here? And these are all the areas where it's just, it's hard for a state to influence, right? Jet fuel, um, uh, refrigerants, things like that, right? So really it has to come from a multi-jurisdictional, multi-governance approach. The federal government has to be part of this. Otherwise states are just gonna be having such an uphill battle. There are things we can do. The, you know, we are still in movement in terms of the Paris Agreement it was very, very important politically during the Trump era. Um, but now that we are actually still in, we need to have the federal government really make good on this. Um, quickly, just one another uh, analysis we recently finished was a study of what if we actually did a state level carbon tax? What could we achieve with that? How much more could we achieve? And would that then help you know, the counties to achieve more, right? Because VMT, vehicle miles traveled reduction would be a lot easier if there was a state level carbon tax, for example. I'll skip to the, the punchline here just because I'm running out of time. And basically we find that at the Obama administration's estimate of social cost of carbon, which starts at around $50, $50 per metric ton and goes to about $70 per metric ton by 2045, we find that you could get from this gray line to this green line. It's a 10% reduction over a 20 year time period. Um, if you had a much, much higher carbon tax, something that started at $250 a ton uh, and went to $1,000 a ton, you could get to this blue line, right? So, so to actually achieve de decarbonization, which it, this isn't even quite, would be very expensive for the state to achieve, right? The economic cost was pretty enormous. If this was done at a national level, it would of course be a lot more muted. muted. Um, but interestingly, at this social cost of carbon uh, estimate where we reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 10%, when monies were given back to households, they were actually made economically better off. So this is sort of a no regrets policy right here for the state to, to achieve. Um, let's get that. So in closing, I'll just say, you know, I'm having, a, I, I was having a moment of sort of hope when I put this slide in, 
uh, to the deck thinking, you know, we, we're, the federal government is back and we're back playing with the international community on climate change. And this is what we, this is what the US absolutely needs. And this is what the world absolutely needs. Um, that said, I also think that much like state level things, I get disheartened because a lot of it does seem like political rhetoric and the actual on the ground implementation falls so short, right? I mean, so recently in the news, it's been this, um, a lot of criticism of the Biden administration of turning around and also, uh, <clears throat> also um, moving forward with the, with the oil drilling in the Alaska North Slope, right? And it's like, if we're allowing new oil drilling, how on earth are we making good on this commitment? And um, so yes, it, we're doing a lot better than we were, but we still, uh, as, a, as a country, have policies that are, are absolutely moving in the wrong direction. And so while I'm hopeful that the 50% reduction by 2030 can, act, can happen, it starts to seem a lot more out of reach when, um, when we have these sort of you know, backpedaling policies that are moving forward rapidly as well. So um, in conclusion, uh, you know, Hawaii's greenhouse gas emissions were, are primarily from the energy sector. Uh, like the other US states, electricity sector is huge um, and it is in very much in state's jurisdiction to, to move forward with decarbonization there. And so that's probably what kind of the most important emphasis should be on. And the question is how to do this well. Right, um, everyone's struggling with how to do this well, when you, especially when you're talking about the layout of renewable energy that we're talking about across the globe, right? And then in particular across Hawaii when we're a very uh, land limited place. Um, the most efficient tool would be to have a carbon tax is to price carbon. Um, and ideally this would be done at a national level, but if Hawaii went this alone, even having you know modest carbon tax, in the, I mean, the social cost of carbon estimate that we looked at would make a, it, it's not actually modest, right? It only reduced it 10%, which is why I call it modest, but it would actually be the largest carbon tax in North America. Um, and if we give the monies back to household, it can actually make uh, low income households particularly better off, but all households better off. Um, so this really is something that Hawaii should think about and pursue. And lastly, there really has to be complementary roles for multiple uh, levels of government, right? The federal government has to come into this much more strongly and the states and municipal governments need to keep moving and push the federal government as well. Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. You kind of brought us back down to earth. <laughs> yeah, we, we know there's, we have a sense of urgency, but we also have to realize that it's the very, very big uh, challenge that's in front of us. And uh, it's interesting to also see it from an island perspective as well. Uh, you've got limitations um, associated with how resources get in and out of Hawaii, et cetera. Um, very, well, maybe similar to Japan, but on a different scale. But uh, mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to hear what uh, Michi has to say. Michi, are you ready to give your presentation? Uh, yes. Can you see my slide? Yep. Okay, um, let me get started. It's very good uh, to hear that America has made a huge progress after Joe Biden was in the power. And actually, I think uh, the US administration positively affect the uh, Japanese uh, climate actions. And in my talk, uh, I would like to share the ideas and the philosophy of local zero carbon strategies in Japan. And I am not going to uh, address the figures, specific country measures, etc. but uh, I want to address uh, the uh, uh, framework to uh, construct the local, local zero carbon strategies uh, by taking a specific project in Shiga and I started with uh, introducing Japanese strategies for zero carbon strategies. And uh, then I would like to identify challenges for local zero carbon strategies. Then I would like to share uh, 
the ongoing project for Shiga Zero Carbon Strategies. Uh, that's a joint project with researchers in uh, other institutes in Kyoto and Shiga Prefecture. Now, uh, I don't know, all of you may not know the Japanese situations on greenhouse gas emissions. Actually, in the past uh, five years, Japanese uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, has decreased. Uh, you see, uh, from the 2012, we see uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions in a row. And you see also uh, Japanese uh, midterm and the long term target. Actually, we have already achieved the 2020 reduction targets, which uh, you can see here. Let me... Okay, here. And also, currently, Japan has a reduction target towards 2030 here, negative 26% compared to the level of 2013. So uh, as far as we look at this figure, we are on the right pathway towards a low carbon society or zero carbon society. Now you see the greenhouse gas emissions by sector in Japan. Uh, this is the latest data. You see uh, energy transformation accounts for the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions, followed by industries and the transportation. And also we have a large share from the uh, buildings, commercial industry and the residential. And what are the implications from this uh, uh, share of greenhouse gas emissions for the local strategy is that uh, we have the local zero carbon strategies play a crucial role uh, because in order to reduce the emissions from energy transformation, we have to increase the renewable energy. And you know, renewable energy uh, is characterized by the small scale and uh, uh, decentralized energy system. Uh, the local communities have a significant role to increase the renewable energies. And also uh, to uh, reduce the emissions from buildings, again, local communities play a crucial role by changing lifestyles or uh, installing uh, much more energy efficient uh, equipment. Now, uh, let me tell you that Japan's climate actions, those are milestones for uh, national level Japanese climate actions. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, held the third conference of the parties in Kyoto. Uh, this is a very important uh, meeting because they uh, come up with uh, Kyoto Protocol, which uh, set up a legally binding reduction targets for industrialized countries. Japan ratified this uh, Kyoto Protocol and uh, uh, actually achieved uh, uh, 6 percent greenhouse gas emission reductions in the uh, a promised period of 2008 and 2012. And uh, followed, uh, uh, this Kyoto Protocol is followed by an uh, act on promotion of global warming countermeasures, uh, which was effective in 1998. And also we have uh, several uh, climate actions at the national level, including uh, feeding tariff for renewable energy uh, to promote the renewable energies. And also the Ministry of the Environment imposed the environmental tax for the fossil fuels uh, use. And also uh, the former uh, administration set up the Global Warming Countermeasures Plan in 2006. And now uh, we see the amendment of Act on Promotion of Global Warming Countermeasures uh, last month. 
uh, which set up a very ambitious uh, emissions reductions target towards 2050. Now, uh, let me tell you uh, the characteristics of global warming countermeasures plan. Uh, we have uh, important pillars of the plan. Number one is uh, we make efforts to achieve the medium term target, uh, which aiming uh, 26 percent decrease uh, emissions in 2030 from the level of 2013. And uh, this plan has the strategy with a long term goal aiming for 80 percent reduction in 2050. And this was changed uh, from this target to uh, net zero emissions in 2050. And also uh, the third pillar includes uh, the address of a contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gas around the world. And I would like to highlight the basic idea of our plan is to integrate the improvement of environment, economy, and society. And also uh, the plan corresponds to the Paris Agreement. And uh, also we highlight the uh, PDCA cycle. So the plan should be uh, transparent and uh, many parties should get involved in the transition towards a uh, zero carbon society. Okay, now uh, I move on to the uh, local zero carbon strategies, but also I should share my views about Japan's climate actions. Uh, so far, we have seen uh, good news, but also we have uh, some uh, kind of negative uh, aspects of Japan's climate actions. Uh, first, I would say uh, there is a powerful influence of the industrial sector on climate actions. K Danren, that's a large corporate federations has had a very strong tie with the uh, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, which has long been in the power. And this uh, K Dunning actually has a strong opposite opinions on carbon pricing. Uh, so although we have a uh, uh, carbon tax uh, on the fossil fuels uh, consumption, but tax rates of this uh, carbon tax is very low. It's around 280 yen per uh, carbon ton uh, consumption. It's very low compared to uh, that in the, uh, Europe. And also we have uh, installed virtually no emissions trading uh, across the nations. That's because of the opposition opinions from the k -Dame. We have very strong power. And uh, uh, because of that, Japan has a favored voluntary based approach, which sounds good, but uh, this means uh, Japanese administration has virtually nothing. And also uh, renewable energy supply remains still at low level. Uh, we still have around 10% of uh, energy supply from uh, renewable energy. Uh, however, we have some advantages in energy savings. In Japan, like maybe Hawaii, uh, almost uh, 96, 97 percent of our primary energy supply comes from overseas. So we are very uh, uh, careful about the energy efficiency. So uh, basically, we have high energy efficiency and less energy intensity per GDP. And uh, last one is uh, kind of unique for Japan. We face a very serious aging and depopulation problems. This in part uh, goods for the uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but uh, as a society, that's a big problem. Okay, now let's move on to the uh, local zero carbon strategies. So having uh, had, had the uh, 
low carbon action plans, the implications for the local, local zero carbon strategies are as follows. Uh, we have to promote measures according to the natural and the social conditions of the area in the field of energy saving, home appliances, energy saving housing, low carbon logistics, smart transportation, and the environmentally friendly lifestyle. And you can uh, see that uh, to promote these uh, counter measures, we have to have some coordination of measures within city planning. And also we have to promote involvement of uh, lifestyle change and the social values. And also uh, I want to say uh, we have to be careful about the differences between the global national strategies and the local activities or local strategies. Uh, usually, I, I, I'm, I'm just generalizing, yeah, but usually global national strategies are on a theoretical basis. They are theoretical uh, driven goals or visions like SDGs, resource circulating society, industry 4.0, or carbon, low carbon society. And they tend to have a centralized decision making systems. And also they are very much knowledge based. And also those organizations have abundant information and financial resources or human resources. And that's comparable uh, to the situations in local uh, strategies. Maybe they have a, uh, practical incentives uh, addressing uh, the quality of life, employment, income, education, housing, uh, safety and clean neighbor, etc. And also they have uh, generate uh, uh, autonomous decision making systems and also they have uh, diverse entities and their incentives may be based on the experiences of the local peoples. And uh, maybe uh, they have uh, endowed with uh, less information and uh, financial resources and human resources. So we have to be careful about those differences to uh, think about the local uh, strategies. Okay, now how uh, those uh, national level plans affected the local uh, zero carbon uh, strategies? Actually, uh, as of May uh, 2020, 386 local governments uh, declared zero carbon society towards 2050. And these uh, local governments cover uh, more than 85% of the Japan's population. And you see uh, those prefectures uh, with a declaration. So that's Good news. Now, uh, let me uh, go into the Shiga case. And this is the greenhouse gas emissions in Shiga. Uh, like the national level emissions, Shiga also uh, showed a decreased trend of emissions. You see a Shiga's target in 2030. We are almost approaching the 2030 uh, targets. And like McKenna said, uh, Shiga also has uh, uh, renewable energy targets, but I don't think uh, Shiga has uh, yet, uh, has not yet have a uh, uh, portfolio, uh, those kind of strategies we do not have yet. Okay, now uh, let me introduce uh, research project just launched uh, in this uh, April, Oshiga Prefecture 2021. And the aim of this project is to construct a graph database of climate change policy system by multiple actors and evaluate the regional characteristics, characteristics impacts. Okay, and that again, this is a joint uh, project 
and uh, PI uh, is belonging to Bureau Environmental Research Institute, Shiga Prefecture. You see the map of Kansai region, Shiga is here. And also some researchers joined this project from National Research Institute for Human and Nature, located in Kyoto here, and uh, uh, myself from Osaka University. Uh, briefly, <laughs> some explanation about Shiga. Shiga is a very beautiful uh, place. Uh, its population is 1.4 million. The size of Shiga Prefecture is 4,000 square kilometer, and 6% of uh, Shiga is mountains, and 70% is occupied by uh, this beautiful lake, Biwa Lake. And actually, this Biwa Lake is the largest lake in Japan, uh, supplying uh, water for more than 1.5 million, sorry, uh, 10. Sorry, 15 million people in the Kansai region. So that's a very important uh, ecosystem. And uh, regarding climate, northern part of Shiga has a heavy snow in winter, and uh, particularly in the south part of Shiga uh, is uh, part of Kyoto metro area. Shiga prefecture has uh, 13 cities, six counties, and many towns and villages. Mostly, except for old city, such city, etc., are rural areas. Okay, now, uh, like other many uh, municipalities, Shiga Prefecture also uh, made a declaration by the Shiga Prefecture Mayor uh, called the Shiga CO2 Net Zero Movement Kickoff Declaration, uh, which was made in January 6, 2020. You see some details of this declaration here. And this aim is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to virtually zero by 2050. And to that objective, she will work on collaboration with various actors, such as citizens of the prefecture and business. So uh, actually, she has not yet any further uh, aggressive plans uh, to achieve that ambitious goal is, is just declaration. And so this fiscal year uh, specific efforts will be included in the Shiga Prefecture Low Carbon Society Creation Promotion Plan, uh, which is revised this year. Okay, so we our project wants to contribute to uh, the construction of Shiga's uh, local their carbon strategies. Okay. Now, uh, let me share our core questions. Our core questions of the project. Number one: uh, How will the measures be realized when they are localized? Because we have uh, many potential measurements, measures, or technologies to achieve low carbon societies. But how will those measures be realized if we think about local conditions? Okay. And also we have uh, different layers of governments and we have to be careful about those differences. And also how we have to uh, think about how the measures will change due to the influence of region characteristics. Okay, that's the first core question of our project. Uh, number two, how are the various projects of civic activities undertaken on a community base positioned in the policy system and the climate change countermeasures, because there are lots of climate actions already going on. And uh, in the meantime, we have also many policy instruments and actions at the government level or prefecture government level, and how we contextualize uh, those local actions into the wider range of uh, policy systems. And also we have to uh, uh, examine the interactions between those uh, different layers of uh, activities and the policies. Okay, and that's the second of our questions. And having uh, uh, those questions in mind, we set up uh, three uh, research topics. First, we uh, are going to develop an integrated climate change countermeasures database by applying graph data theory 
uh, which uh, tries to visualize characteristics of climate change countermeasures and the network structures uh, using text mining methods, because we have many uh, actions that are documented. So we, we can construct those visualized uh, database uh, to uh, extract the characteristics of each actions and the connections between uh, different actions in the policies. Uh, number two, uh, we are going to analyze the structure of the policy system by networking and analysis and the data science methods. And by doing so, we also examine the process of differentiation and uh, the influence of regional characteristics and evaluate the impact of consistency of the entire policy system. Okay, we have many activities and many uh, policy instruments may be coming uh, in the next decades. And we have to uh, make them efficient to achieve the goal. So we have to realize uh, the connections and the characteristics of each policies. Okay. And third term uh, theme uh, is to create a community chart to comprehensively grasp the actual conditions of various community level uh, civic activities and sorting it in the integrated climate change countermeasures database. And by doing so, uh, we can position uh, those activities as a climate change policy system. And also we want to assess the interactions between policy and the community activities. Okay, uh, and the project is just started. And let me uh, uh, summarize the project concepts and the philosophy. Okay, now maybe we, our members are local government officials and experts, right? And we can help uh, the construction of Giga Zero carbon strategies. Okay, first we are going to uh, build a graph database of integrated climate change countermeasures. Okay, to reveal the characteristics of individual activities and the policies and uh, also examine the connections among them. And also we uh, built a community chat and uh, going to make interactions with uh, local people, right? Uh, by doing workshops, right? And uh, those local people can understand the current situations of the community, right? And uh, having their opinions, we can uh, update the local charts. And also having uh, them understand the current situations and also uh, to come up with some uh, envisioned society or envisioned the community, desirable society for their community in 2050, uh, they may come up with new ideas of their uh, climate actions, right? So those interactions is one line. And also uh, maybe these workshop can uh, provide some information uh, for updating the graph database, right? And by analyzing this graph databases, uh, the governments, local governments is gonna going to do some uh, construct regulations or maybe use those information for budgeting or to construct the roadmaps, or they understand the network to create a net, new networking or a new project. So I, we, we think uh, uh, we want to disseminate these ideas for Shiga Zero Carbon Strategy, okay? So far, we have uh, created a database of local actions and countermeasures in Shiga. We have this kind of database, we and uh, each, uh, countermeasures is sorted by formulation date, edition, mitigation database, measures, greenhouse gas type, de department fields, entities, countermeasures type, details of efforts, etc. And using this uh, meta database, we are going to construct the graph database. And also, we have developed a community evaluation chart uh, by taking a Takashima city as a case. Okay. Okay, let me finish. 
okay, th this is how uh, the community chart will look like. We have built up the chart for 2010 communities in Takashima City. And also we have uh, held already some workshops to talk about the visions of the community or to talk about the challenges or problems of the community. Okay. Uh, now, this is the last slide. So uh, our philosophy of local zero carbon strategies are as follows. If you look at the SDGs, maybe you imagine this picture, but the core concept of SDGs is as follows. One is no one left behind. Second is participation by all. We want to ensure participation by all. And also it's a process toward 2030. We have to be transparent. We have to transparent the process to achieve the goals. So uh, by reflecting those uh, uh, values and the philosophy of SDGs, maybe our local zero carbon strategies uh, is going to take this iterated process by visualizing climate actions, ensuring the transparency of the decarbonization process, increasing citizens' involvement, facilitating networking and the collaboration among the communities and entities, and improving the climate actions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richie. Um... I, I like how you added the research dimension to this, and I think it's a really important um, angle. And I, you know, there is, there have been lots of questions popping up about how do we do this? And I think that um, we do need more research. So uh, we need to be able to answer questions. And I think it's also something that McKenna also highlighted is that we don't have all the answers right now to some of these problems. So we definitely need, um, uh, researchers and universities in particular to be focusing on these questions. Um, just one quick announcement. There is uh, for those students who have their name in Chinese characters, if you could just basically uh, put them in, in English so, so we can read them. We just need to uh, track who is attending. Um, if you could just quickly change your name, that would be fantastic. There's a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, McKenna, there's a couple from Tanvi, which I think are really relevant to the Hawaii case. One on the cultural historical reasons for Hawaii's um, response to sustainability. And then the other one is about giving states and cities more freedom to decide climate policy. What do you think? I know, thank you. Thank you for the questions, Tanvi. Um, I'll start with the second. So. I'm really always torn. I mean, the, the United States is so interesting because of the federal state dynamic and sort of things that are in federal powers versus state powers. And in general, I like the idea of empowering sort of uh, as close to, you know, communities who really understand their situation as possible. That said, it doesn't always work, particularly when you're talking about a global commons issue, right? Um, so in this case, I actually think that federal policies are gonna be a lot more effective, you know, not uh, both for sort of the jurisdictional issues, but also sort of the breadth of the ability to affect markets. Um, so something, you know, Michi was saying, we really do want these policies to, you know, interact well and to be as efficient as possible. And so mainly I think that has to come with the federal approach uh, in the US context. So, um, and, and I think to, what the heart of your question is also, if we gave uh, states more leeway, some states would do better like California and I think Hawaii and some states would do a lot worse, right? So um, it would probably end up canceling each other out. And then in terms of Hawaii and sort of, you know, uh, sustainability more broadly, I do think that just being from, you know, being an island region and having a rich history in terms of Native Hawaiian land stewardship, that there is a lot of um, sort of understanding of the limits to, you know, limits to extraction, limits to growth, um, and then sort of a lot of community support for stewardship of that. In the climate space and climate action, it doesn't necessarily come with clear answers, right? 
um, in terms of what does that mean for modern technologies like wind turbines and where do we put them? But I do think that it makes for an overall easier conversation with the support, you know, people generally understanding that this is an important transition, particularly because the impacts of climate change to Hawaii are going to be so devastating as well. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, I think there are two, also two questions from Tanvi to you, Michi. One is about um, the Suga government. Mm -hmm. and uh, its influence on the trajectory. And the other is about Shiga Prefecture and how typical is it or how does it compare to other local authorities? Okay, um, thank you, Tambi, for all good questions. How Suga, conservative Suga as in restaurant affects the climate actions? Well, um, I think uh, after Suga was in the power, I think climate, uh, policies in Japan has changed toward uh, more preferable, uh, the better ways. Uh, maybe Biden as administration affected uh, his attitude toward uh, climate actions. And the, in fact, the last month, uh, the administration declared zero, net zero carbon emissions in 2050. And that affects also the, uh, many of the local governments. Uh, for declaration and uh, I don't know for the next as an administration but uh, that's the current situations of uh, uh, impacts and uh, the as an administration and the regarding Shiga Shiga is a very environmentally uh, friendly prefecture maybe because of Bia Lake Lake Biwa and you know, to maintain the ecosystems of Biwa is very important for uh, Shiva's and the local people. And uh, actually, uh, you, you see the uh, Lake Biwa Environmental Science Institute, right? And not many prefectures have their own research institute for the environment, but Shiga has had and uh, having a long history of doing environmental research to protect the ecosystems of uh, Lake Biwa. And uh, I think there is a difference between Shiga and the other prefectures, but some uh, places are very uh, aggressive for uh, climate actions. Great, thank you. There's actually another question for you mm -hmm. uh, from the Netherlands, basically on mm -hmm. uh, the um, community Visioning process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does it? How does it incorporate that into the planning process? Are you using future design here? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's a very difficult question for me. Uh, what is the process? Well, um, there are lots of communities, right? And I cannot uh, visit all the communities, but uh, I think we can build up some models to uh, come up with uh, community visions and uh, come up with some specific actions, right? We are now visiting several communities uh, to talk about the futures of the community and uh, also addressing the current situations, current challenges, and also uh, to talk about uh, specific projects. And uh, maybe we, once we have some uh, successful cases for uh, visionings and uh, making some uh, specific projects, then we can disseminate those ideas uh, throughout the prefectures. And uh, you talk also about uh, future design. Is yeah, design process here, right? Uh, that's also a good question. Research design is a kind of a new research area uh, for deliberation or decision making process. And we, in deliberation, we invite uh, imaginary future generations because future generation is a very important stakeholder, right? And uh, actually, we have found you know those invitations of future generations positively affect the decision making process and also uh, consensus uh, processes. So uh, yes, we apply those uh, feature design process to uh, envision the community uh, 
in the future, etc. I think that could be a separate webinar just on future envisioning processes and how they connect into uh, decarbonization policies. There's a couple of questions. I don't really know who to um, share them with. I mean, McKenna, the, the question by Lu Jung on, you know, the, another industrial revolution in a few years, I think it's more tied into uh, IT, um, on the online use of energy, Bitcoin and so on. Do you have any um, thoughts about that and its impact on CO2 emissions? None very clearly formed, right? I mean, I think the research on the energy intensity of Bitcoin is becoming more and more clear. Um, there were a couple of really good articles published in Nature Climate Change on that in the last couple of years. But I mean, but it's also a lot. So there's the energy component of it which are, you know, you could argue could become renewable energy, uh, but I think there's also just the broader, the broader question of it as a currency, right? And so, um, but then the other component of this question, uh, which is really interesting, right, is if there are sort of different waves of technology, maybe that we are, that we don't have, you know, on our, on the tips of our tongue right now, but they're really CO2 intensive, what do we do with that, right? Do we allow it to happen? And I guess my response to that is that's why I think the that's why I think a carbon price is so important, right? That if we we shouldn't necessarily have the ability or to say like oh that should happen and that shouldn't happen because we because there are different communities there are different norms there are different senses of what is important, but if we can at least uh, help people prioritize that based on a carbon price, that's really uh, a critical way to do it. So, that. great, thank you. There's also a question from Sufian about um, the, you know, the influences of current developing emerging uh, countries that are striving for strong economic growth and whether there are sufficient plans there to make this growth sustainable as possible. I think that kind of ties into questions of fairness and equity between countries, because there are some countries who still feel like um, well, we we need we need to use more of the carbon budget, um, and uh, it's not fair if we can't grow to the same degree as say U.S. or Japan have. And I think that's a really good point. And I would say that the the emphasis on accelerated decarbonization should be on the already fully developed industrial economies. They should do it first. But this has also been an age old old. Uh, and discussion, especially in climate negotiations of common but differentiated responsibilities. But I, um, I don't think it's really work, working effectively, but I think that we also need to see technology transfer. We need to see financial support uh, for those economies that are trying to make the transition at whatever level they are. So it's a really critical question there, Sophie, and so thank you for raising it. Um, there was also a question that popped in that I answered um, of, uh, just by typing the response, which was about um, car companies in Japan and whether they're really getting fully engaged. Um, and I just wonder, Michi, if you have any thoughts on that. I said they need to do much more, <laughs> but uh, yeah. uh, it's, not, it's not there anymore because I answered it. But there was an interesting question about what Toyota should be doing. And, oh. Yeah. I think car makers are very aggressive for uh, making new technologies, low carbon technologies for uh, mobility. Uh, otherwise, they cannot supply the market, right? Right, that's, that's true. That's my it, answer. it could well be that um, even trade barriers come up uh, to mm -hmm. export mm -hmm. countries that uh, push very aggressive um, mm -hmm emission reduction limits, et cetera. And also electric only policies are popping up all over. Mm -hmm. I think even Japan has one for 2035. 20, 20, um, it's not fixed, but it's a proposal that uh, no more uh, internal combustion engines mm -hmm. after, after that date. You know. And also the other thing is the price of uh, uh, fossil fuels are increasing while the price of renewables are decreasing. So, you know, many uh, industries have incentives to use more renewable energies right. than fossil fuels. So def definitely the mo mobility is a big 
challenge. Um, and, um, and McKenna mentioned it also in the case of Hawaii as well. Mm -hmm. There's one question that hasn't been answered and that's from Joanne Bin, I think about reducing construction land plus technological process and the benefits that has for emission reductions. I think, I think actually it was John Kerry who said uh, very recently that um, a lot of the emission reductions can come through technological pro uh, progress, but he got attacked <laughs> uh, by many commentators in saying that let's not let's not over rely on uh, on a techno fix. That uh, we have to also take into consideration societal transformation and behavioral change, and and really across the board um, changes. So just fixating on one type of response, like geoengineering, is not necessarily going to help us uh, mm -hmm. in, in rapid uh, decarbonization. Mm -hmm. OK, well, I think that's all the questions answered. We've gone a little bit over time. Um, I want to thank our two speakers uh, today for two very interesting presentations. And I kind of feel like the presentations interconnected you know, we saw different aspects of the same problem, but we know it's a huge problem and it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for us to address it. Um, I know McKenna, it's actually, although it looks nice and sunshiny behind you, it's actually um, 30 min 40 minutes past midnight. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for staying up and uh, participating. I really appreciate it, but also thank you to uh, our audience. Um, I know you are joining us from different parts of the world, perhaps some from, from Europe and um, also from across Asia and, and from Australia. So we're really happy that you could join us um, today. Just want to point out, and if I can share my screen, uh, let me bring this up. Uh, no, yeah. actually I, I won't bother, but um, can, you, can you see this? Basically, next week we will have a, uh, a presentation where we're going to dig more into the climate science. And we have presenters from University College London, but also we have Professor Dakal, who is from the Asian Institute of Technology. And he's also a member of the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So you'll get some insights on uh, where's, the, where's the climate science right now. And um, I think you'll find that very interesting. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing you um, next week, same time, uh, same place for uh, another webinar. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. And um, see you next week. And thank you again to our wonderful speakers. Thank you very much. And that's the end. <laughs>